Hi, Manchkins and everyone from Manchester. Welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. It is episode 35, and as you can see, I'm recording here from my home studio on the west side of Manchester. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, today, I am going to do a bit of a mix of stuff. I wanted to check in with you guys about something that was brand new that I'd never seen before, and that was a poll that came out asking more about free staters. Um, I wanted to read you a few letters to the editor that I've seen floating around, including one that I wrote that was published in the Sunday Union Leader, uh, sort of in defense of free staters, because I'm sure if you've been following along, the frequency's pretty high, pretty negative, pretty nasty out there. And, you know, I'm just going to give it an old college try to be like, we come in peace, regardless of what people who lie to you about everything have to say about it. Um, and then, if we have enough time, I am going to read you a review of my book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope Mostly, which, uh, you know, you can check out on Amazon. So that is sort of the lay of the land for today. I'm going to start with just with a little notion about free speech. Um, and if we have time, maybe we will drop in the video as well. But if I don't get to that, please go find it online. It is of the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Uh, I forget her name, but uh, it's that sort of with all due respect, horse facey kind of lady. Now, of course, New Zealand was one of the countries that really locked down, that really went into this overdrive of COVID mania. And uh, this lady gives this little speech in at the UN, which quite frankly is chilling. It is terrifying. She goes as far as to say that words, speech that she doesn't like are now weapons of war. That's where we are, folks. We are at the stage where the enemies of liberty are saying things like, if you say stuff we don't like, we're going to call it a warlike thing. Um, and that is troubling because that is where they actually start to criminalize speech. Now, of course, in some Western countries, uh, mostly in, in Europe, as well as in Australia and by the sounds of it, also in New Zealand, uh, they have actually criminalized speech. They put it under the auspices of hate speech. And honestly, now that I'm at the end of a lot of hate speech, uh, you know, I kind of understand the desire to, to push back and to be like, you're not allowed to say that about me. But here's the reality. As I say often on the show, good speech should crowd out bad speech. And it's up to you to be able to listen to different sides, different opinions, and then figure out what the truth is. So, um, so go find that clip and uh, go take a look. It's certainly on my Twitter feed. If you go to my Twitter profile, which is under my name, Carla Garrick, you can go to my Facebook as well. Please also, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Better yet, if you're watching this on Censor Proof Odyssey, hit that follow button and never miss another moment with me. So, all right. This poll that came out today. Now, this frankly surprised me. This was a poll that came out from the University of uh, Suffolk. So Suffolk U and the Boston Globe. And it was a poll that was bigger than just the Free State Project. But the 20th question on this, uh, this poll had to do with what people uh, think about the Free State Project and what the sort of support is for them. Now, I've certainly never seen something like this before. I was surprised, and I'm surprised mostly because we do know there is a lot of media interest suddenly. Um, I'm sure I've told you guys, you know, the NBC Boston has been out here following us around various free staters. I've spent, you know, a good chunk of time, probably 10 hours at this stage, 
with them. I had a gentleman here in the office with me from the New Yorker a few weeks ago. He claimed that he was doing a story on the Democrats, but that somehow the free staters were a big part of that story. Um, and the Boston Globe has covered us. There was a big piece that came out a few weeks ago, and I believe another one coming out soon. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely a lot of interest. New York Sun has been covering us. In fact, that is where I saw this poll. And, um, and so the poll basically asked, uh, you know, people... Pretty much, they were just polling whether people had heard of us, whether if they had heard of us, they had a favorable opinion, an unfavorable opinion, or undecided. So I'm going to give you the totals first, but, you know, and, and this is interesting because I was like, should I share this? It doesn't really make us look that great. But one, everyone who knows me believes, knows I believe in transparency. So I'd rather give you the good news and bad news than just kind of not talk about it. And also, I am, you know, despite what my book says, I am the eternal optimist. And, you know, if you're down here, mostly the only place you can go is up. So, so that's where I'm coming from. So in this poll, again, University of Suffolk and the Boston Globe, uh, it was only 500 respondents, but be that as it may, 51% have never heard of the Free State Project, okay? So 51% of 500 people, so that's 251 people, have never heard of the Free State Project. Of the people who have heard of us, 10% had a favorable opinion. Thank you. 26% had an unfavorable opinion and 13% were undecided. Now, what does that mean to me? To me, it means that if you add the undecided and the favorable, you get more or less the same number as the unfavorable. So of the 50% of people who've heard of us, it's a 50-50 mix, which makes sense to me because New Hampshire kind of is, you know, split that way. It gets a little more interesting when you drill down into the different parties. Um, so they do break it up into Democrats, Republicans, and independents. So of the Democrats, only 49% have never heard of us. So that means we actually have a deeper penetration under the Democrats than we do under the Republicans, where it was 62%, or independents, where it was 44%. So this was the percentages of people who have never heard of us. I think it's really interesting, actually, that uh, 62% of Republicans say they've never heard of us. Of those in those demographics, so we're going to go Democrats, Republicans, Independents, um, favorable for Democrats was 6%. Makes sense. They don't really like us. Uh, Republicans, it was 14%. So that was uh, more than double. And amongst Independents who have heard of us, 10% have a favorable opinion. So that's the same as on par with the total. Unfavorable, Here's where it gets interesting. Under Democrats, now remember, unfavorable total was 26%. Under Democrats, it's 36%. So it's a much higher percentage of Democrats who don't like free staters. Now, that makes sense to me because Democrats are trending more um, anti-liberty, anti-freedom, anti-choice, anti-parental choice, uh, all of those things. So 36% of Democrats in this 500-person poll don't like free staters. Only 13% of Republicans had an unfavorable view. And then interestingly, under independence, 27% had an unfavorable view. So those, you know, I, I'm not sure what that means. And then amongst, un, you know, and then the last category was undecided. So just people who've uh, never heard of or undecided, or they're just not sure what to think, which I think is the way to approach free staters, because that's pretty much the way to approach humans, right? Like if you've never heard of someone or met someone, why would you have an opinion about them? Because that doesn't really make sense. So uh, undecided, Democrats, 9%, Republicans, 11%, and independents who'd never heard of 
uh, it was 19%. Now, the poll is up on my Twitter feed at Carla Garrick, so you can go look at it there if you want to drill down a little bit more into it. It is broken out by age, demographics, and all of that kind of stuff as well. But... Um, but, you know, I just kind of wanted to give you guys an overview. I think it's a massive, massive compliment that everyone is taking uh, free staters so seriously suddenly. Um, I think it is the new cycle. I think it is the election cycle. I think it probably behooves certain groups to try and uh, create a, a story here. But you know what? Honestly, I have spent the 14 years I've lived in New Hampshire trying to promote the Free State Project, trying to get more people to know about it. So, you know, if it's going to take polls from universities in Massachusetts, and from big newspapers outside the state to raise our profile. And, uh, you know, for the New York Times and the Boston Globe and the New Yorker and the New York Sun and all of these, uh, these media folks to really start to raise the bar for us, I'm just going to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Why am I grateful? One, I have nothing to hide. Two, I'm actually really, really proud of what I'm doing in New Hampshire. I think that I'm a, 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 um, a bondbreaker, I can't think of the English word right now, uh, a, a, a visionary, a futurist, someone who was right 15 years ago when I decided to move here. Um, we know the economy is getting worse. Um, I was right on the economy. I was right on inflation. These energy costs are going to go through the roof. We cannot afford the government that these people are demanding, and you cannot live off the backs of your neighbors forever. So, uh, so, you know, let's do it. So along the same vein, I would like to read you a couple of, uh, a couple of letters to the editor that have actually come out in the union leader in the past few weeks. So I'm going to start with the one I sent in, actually, which was in the Sunday paper. And uh, this one had the headline, Free Staters are New Hampshire Allies. And it says to the editor, the vitriol against free staters must stop. I'm receiving death threats. Democrats are calling for our extermination. Twitter took weeks to remove this. And I received a letter at my house calling me the C word and telling me to get the F out of our state. Whose state? About 70% of the legislature was not born here. Individuals moving here to bolster the New Hampshire advantage, as well as as thousands of Granite Staters who now self-identify as Free Staters are allies, not enemies. Like you, Free Staters want limited government, low taxes, no income tax, and school choice. We subscribe to the non-aggression principle, the ethical stance that you cannot force someone to do something against their will, and the slogan, don't hurt people, and don't take their stuff. We believe you are the best steward of your life and money. We believe the economic prosperity and the quality of life found in the live free or die state is worth preserving. Sometimes, granted, the methods employed to reverse the harm that is being inflicted by Democrats and rhinos won't appeal to all. On the flip side, they locked you down and called you non-essential. As a student of history, this is much, much worse than using the democratic process to try and cut a school budget or reform a government-owned ski resort. Free staters come in peace. We're building a consent-based society in strong communities focused on a brighter future. If you are against free staters, you support the control and subjugation of your neighbors. Be a free stater instead. So, you know, you're limited to word count there. So that was, uh, you know, 
you got to be short and powerful, but you get the message. You know, we come in peace. We believe in the ethical stance of the non-aggression principle, which also is extended to the government, meaning that Karen down the street who wants me to subsidize her crap doesn't get to do that because she doesn't own my labor. I am not a slave to my neighbors and equally my neighbors are not a slave to me. If someone is in need, then we can do and help people through private charity, through our churches, through social organizations, through private nonprofits and all of that. The only people who benefit from big government are usually people in the middle taking a little bennies for themselves. And how do I know that? Why does everyone who goes to federal Congress, they earn what, $170,000 a year? They go in with that salary and they all leave with millions and millions and millions of dollars in their pockets. It's corrupt, it's in front of your eyes, it's their plain as day for you to see. All right, two other really short ones and then uh, we will get into the review of my book. So this one says, letter, broad strokes are painting free staters as all alike. This one came out on September 28th, 22, and it says, to the editor, there seems to be quite the chatter about free staters of late. As a new mover to the live free or die state, I had to see what it's all about for myself. I don't know this person, by the way. Um, it appears the old traditional values of it takes a village is the mantra here. Free staters seem to be aggressively pursuing a community vibe or working together for the good of themselves and their communities. They want to trade with each other so Uncle Sam can't siphon off the top, and they want to be able to choose whether services should be provided by the community or by the government. In my experience, the former is much more efficient. Maybe some free staters lack the social skills to convey this message, and maybe some are dubious, but I would argue the same for all of humanity. Maybe before we cast a broad shadow on a group of well-meaning people, we should talk to them face to face. This was written by uh, Brian Kirby uh, on Springwood Way, Manchester. So thank you, Brian, for the kind words. I 100% agree with you. Don't form opinions based on other people's opinions. I have on my website, carlagarrick.com, there's 10 years of content you can go look at to be like, what is this free stater about? Also, you can read my book. I mean, it's right there. There are lots of essays and stuff. Um, and you can, you know, make an effort, come meet us, come, you know, come to one of the public meetings, come to, you know, our conferences. It's, uh, you know, we're not hiding. So, uh, you know, get to know us. All right. This one is letter support candidates who support Liberty. This was September 23rd, um, of this year, of course. And this one says New Hampshire works just fine as it is to the editor. The elections are coming up and many Democrats who recently moved to New Hampshire will be voting Democrat just as they did where they used to live. Democrats came here because they didn't like it where they were and now they want to change here to be like there. Please don't do this. We are not racist, phobic or anti whatever. We simply like the way it is here because it's not like there. We are fine the way we are. We do not need to be banned, regulated, taxed, or watched over. We have the lowest homicide rate in the U.S., the lowest unemployment rate in the country, no sales, and no income tax. Our systems work fine. We have the freedom to adjust to things as they come along, and we can add, change, or drop services, what, whatever works for us as individuals. We limit the things people are forced to do, because that's what government is, force, or to pay for. We are a state of wonderful people that just want to be left alone. Newcomers can do their thing without bringing the force of government into the mix. We operate a win-win system here, and everyone is happy or it doesn't happen. Democrats 
rely on force to have people do what they believe is right. Vote for liberty-minded candidates and keep New Hampshire like it is here, not there. That one is by Edward Smith. Um, I believe he's out of Concord. I have met him. He's an older gentleman, super nice guy. So those are just three short letters to the editor that were recently published in the Union Leader. And, you know, the reason I read these is because the vitriol, as I said in my own letter, is really reaching a bit of a... Uh, Zenith. I mean, it's a little mad out there. I was just looking at, you know, the, the, the hater messages out there. In fact, there was a message by Rosemary Rung. I mentioned this on Manch Talk on Tuesday where, um, you know, she said something like the way you can identify uh, political candidates who are free staters. And this, by the way, is not necessarily correct, but, but this is the level of madness that we're now dealing with. As she said, um, their, their literature, their political literature has words like freedom, liberty, and choice on there. And I was like, man, lady, do you hear yourself? Because um, if you're not for freedom, liberty, and choice, what are you for? I mean, let, let's break that down just for half a second. Um, the opposite of freedom is slavery. The opposite of liberty is slavery, subjugation, control. Um, the opposite of choice is force. So if you actually think it's a bad thing that your political candidates believe in freedom, then I don't think you should be running for office candidly. I mean, I don't think any Granite Stater should be voting for authoritarians who will openly state that they are anti-liberty and anti-freedom, which, of course, is what this lady was saying. So, you know, please keep that in mind as we, you know, head into this election season. The nonsense and the frequency out there is... Ugh, it's just gross. I mean, politics is just <laughs> a nasty game and it is really not pleasant out there. I have seen just ridiculous ads. I mean, if you go research the the the, the amount of fake news in Pappas's ads, I mean, where he even admitted it, um, it, it, it's just, it's shocking. So I don't know if the PACs can just get away with it, the political action commit, uh, commissions or whatever committees, I guess, uh, the funny money, the sludge, the black money, the dark money, you know. So uh, it is a free speech issue. They should be able to do it. Now, technically, if you're lying, you should you shouldn't lie, right? Because that's fraud. That is misleading someone. Um, and so if someone is blatantly lying, as they are doing on uh, several uh, candidates on the Republican sides, uh, you know, we should call it out. So I'm going to call out at least Chris Pappas's abortion and Hassan's abortion ads are nonsense. They're lying to you. But the important issue for this election is going to be the three E's. What are those? Those are energy costs, education, meaning school choice, and uh, the economy. I thought it was really funny. I was on a call the other day and I heard um, someone say the famous quote, it's the economy, stupid. And I was like, oh, that was my line. I mean, I know it's an old political line, but I actually used that in 2016 in my first race for Senate. Uh, because I knew back then that all the things that we are now seeing come to a head were going to start to happen. How did I know that? Because I'm not an idiot. And even you and I both know if you don't balance your uh, checkbook for, I don't know, 100 years while also borrowing money and then getting more and more credit cards to pay off the debt for the previous credit cards at some stage... Yeah, things are going to go pear-shaped. So I believe we're in the pear-shaped stage of things. We are living beyond our means. And honestly, by 2030, we will not in this country be able to service our debt, which means, I mean, anyway, so it's not good. So if you want people who actually understand what the challenges are, who are willing to say the truth to you so that we can start to fix these problems, please vote for them. 
So if you see people with the words liberty, freedom, individualism, rights, school choice, all the good stuff in it, please, please, please support those candidates. All right. Last but not least, um, I was super, super thrilled to get this uh, this nice little review. Um, you know, my book's been out for a couple of years now, I guess. And... Uh, I just wish more people would actually buy it and read it. You know, I'm pretty sure there are a handful of Democrats out there who would actually read my book and then be like, I like this lady. It's okay. I like you too. All right. So um, so this came in from a reader and I'm just going to read the review. And then if there's time left over, uh, I will uh, maybe read us a story, but I don't think we're going to have time. So... This is from Daniel Donnelly. Thank you so much. And anyone who ever wants to reach me, you can reach me at Carla at Carla Garrick dot com. Uh, I am happy to get emails. I'm happier when they're nice. I'm not so happy when they're not nice. But, you know, if you really have to get something off your chest, have at it, folks. All right. Daniel says, in late May, I tuned into the Carla Garrick show. Step number one to be a number one fan. All right. In late May, I tuned into the Carla Garrick show, which featured an interview of Miss Garrick talking about her book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope, mostly. I only knew Miss Garrick as the Free State Project's former president, so I had no idea that years ago she had launched a career as a professional author. Wanting a break from the more laborious reading that I had fallen, which had fallen to me lately, I ordered The Ecstatic Pessimist and quickly discovered that it was much more than a mere autobiography. The work is a compilation of Garrick's autobiographical accounts, editorials, speeches, and short stories written between 2004 and 2020. The autobiographical pieces cover Garrick's upbringing in South Africa, her immigration to the United States, and finally her transition from a career as a lawyer to one as a creative writer. From far from a dry chronicle, the pieces are set as intriguing stories with a fair amount of humor. The editorials and speeches are great polemic against the coercive state. You get a first-hand view into the Free State Project's challenges and how activists have been overcoming them to expand civil liberties in New Hampshire. Anyone interested in advocacy for liberty can take these accounts as a playbook to implement in other parts of the world, though assuredly, Gerke Garrick would beckon you to join them in the Free State, Live Free or Die State. My personal favorites have to be the short stories and flash fictions, which paint compelling characters in unique situations. Some of these situations may be quite unlike, sorry, some of these situations may be quite unlike lived experience. I, for one, have never been a deaf girl in a deaf family, nor a Johannesburg socialite, yet the stories masterfully resolve to the universal vulnerabilities and occasional triumphs of spirit which define the human condition. Across the span of a few pages flow profoundly moving narratives about what happens in the conscience when we lose that chance to say farewell to someone we love or how a child's rebellious act of kindness can propel a nation to glory worldwide. So... I was quite moved by that. I thought he sort of captured the spirit of what I was going for. So again, check out my book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope Mostly. Uh, you can find that on my website, carlagarrick.com or on Amazon. I think we're probably out of time or possibly even over time. So I am going to thank you for joining me this week. I look forward to being with you again next week. If you're watching this and you would like a yard sign or support my race um, in Ward 11 in Manchester, I'm running as a Republican. I really, really want to get in and show you guys what I can do to help make the world or at least New Hampshire or at least Ward 11 a better place. Thanks for joining me. And remember, together, 
we can live free and thrive.